Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Wednesday morning's online breakfast seminar. Today we're talking about the JCT standard forms and the presenter is Richard Silver, senior partner of Silver Shin Ash. As always during the presentation, if you have any questions or queries, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A panel um, on the bottom toolbar there and Richard will uh, answer all of these at the end of the session. Um, and again, as always, if there's any specific issues you have or queries, please feel free to email Richard directly on richardsilver at silverllp.com. So without any further ado, we will start this morning's presentation. Richard, over to you. Thank you, Julie. Good morning, all. Um, as Judy has said, we're going to cover design and particularly design under the JCT standard form design and build 2016 edition. Um, starting point is with Article 1, which requires the contractor to complete the design for the works and carry out and complete the construction of the works in accordance with the contract documents. Um, the important point first to emphasize, to emphasize obviously is the reference to design. But the important point is, is it says to complete the design. And therefore in the standard form, unless otherwise amended, if there is no design to complete, there is no design obligation. As we're going to deal with, as we go through uh, the course this morning, we'll in, we will identify that quite often this obligation is amended and the design obligation is moved to what is commonly referred to as design and dump. But under the standard form, you only have to complete the design. So far as that design is concerned, it is to carry it out in accordance with the employer's requirements and the contractor's proposals. They are deemed to be two separate documents. And what we've got in the contracts is a definition as to what are the contract documents, being the agreement, the conditions, the employer's requirements, the contractor's proposals, and the contract sum analysis. Now, it is not uncommon for the employer's requirements to be produced and that they are so detailed that the contractor decides that there is little purpose if, of producing any contracted proposals. So instead, simply says that the employer's requirements shall be the contractor's proposals. Um, for those of you who are contractors, I strongly recommend you don't do that. We have a contract where the employer's requirements, where they include design, place the obligation as to the adequacy of that design with the employer and not the contractor. If, however, the contractor takes on board the employer's requirements and says that they're his, he is taking responsibility for any inadequacies within them. So you don't want to do that. What's more, we have a contract that has expressed terms with different responsibilities, risks and actions, depending upon whether the issue arises in the ERs or the CPs. And where you've only got in effect one part of one set of documents, the ERs, the contract doesn't really match what has actually been issued and can create some considerable different difficulties. So important to re-emphasize, we should have two documents, the employer's requirements and the contractor's proposals. Employer's requirements, if there is any design undertaken within them by the employer prior to the appointment of the contractor, the employer is responsible for them save for where the contract has been amended. So far as the contractor's proposals are concerned, obviously the contractor takes responsibility for those and indeed will further issue um, design development as the works progress. Whilst not dealing specifically with design, I just refer to the contract sum analysis. Generally, design and build contracts are larger projects. And from my experience, whilst it's design and build, there are often changes. 
In order to value those changes, we use the contract sum analysis. Equally, when paying for interim or making interim payments, such assessment is to be based upon the contract sum analysis. So therefore, the contract sum analysis ought to be fairly detailed to enable and assist the employer's agent both to value the works as they progress and to certify the amounts due, and secondly, to enable the valuation of changes. Unfortunately, in my experience, the contract sum analysis all too often is inadequately detailed, which makes it very difficult to ascertain exactly what is the correct amount to be certified in interim payments, and moreover, the ability to value changes. Under the standard building form, we have a completely different nature of assessment. Now, going back to the employer's requirements, what is intended is that the employer can put down as much detail as to the design of the works as they choose or leave greater flexibility to the contractor. What sometimes happens is the amount of design can almost fit on the back of a stamp. In other circumstances, you can find that the works have almost been fully designed or anything in between. What the contractor then is meant to do is to further develop that design to the completed design. Now, as I've said, it is possible for the complete design to have been carried out in the ERs. And if the amendment I've suggested is made, which makes the contractor responsible for that design, we have what is referred to as design and dump. In other words, there has been a completed design by the employer where the employer has specified quite clearly what is to be carried out to the nth degree. Everything has been designed. They have set down exactly what they want, but Nevertheless, the contractor takes responsibility for that design. And this can be potentially a major problem. I was involved in one project um, a few years ago where this is exactly what had happened. The employer had undertaken the design and then had amended the contract so the contractor was responsible for that design. And within that design requirements, within the employer's requirements, they had detailed that the contractor would provide a certain amount of square footage of the completed building. But, as, but the building as designed didn't meet that requirement. But because the way the contract had been amended, the contractor was responsible for that failure, despite them having no input to it whatsoever. So do be careful. Do, if you are a contractor, look into whether or not you are taking responsibility for the employer's requirements. And if so, you're satisfied that that is something you have priced for. Similarly, if you're an employer, this is one of the standard amendments that are made to this form and which very much reduce your risk. As far as the contractor is concerned, where the ERs and the CPs do not include all the design for the works, the contractor being the design and build, um, responsible for both the design and build, is obliged to issue for approval drawings showing his further development of the design. And there is a choice. The contract provides either for a design submission procedure as set out in Schedule 1, or there can be other amendments that are included into the contract for the issue of such design. So far as the design submission process is concerned, the contractor issues to the employer his drawings, 
and the employer is required to come back and to complete those and to, uh, to either approve, reject or provide comments on those drawings within 14 days. If he fails to do so, obviously this can potentially be a delaying event, a relevant amend. What the employer does, as I say, is to issue A, B or C. Where it's C, the contractor has to resubmit and seek approval before commencing. Where B, the contractor can actually carry out the works in accordance with those drawings, but subject to complying with any comments uh, added. Or on A, he can simply carry it out because those drawings have been approved. Now, it is the case that in some circumstances where drawings are not approved, it's because what the employer is seeking to do through the back door is seek revisions to the employer's requirements. In other words, what the contractor has submitted for approval meets both the CPs and ERs, and there's no reason for rejection. But the employer's agent has nevertheless rejected them and stated on them, you know, what needs to be done. If the contractor disagrees with such comments or rejections applying to B or C, he must come back within seven days explaining why he so disagrees. If he doesn't, but nevertheless carries out the works in accordance with the comments as required, he cannot seek a change to the employer's requirements. In other words, he carries out those revised additional works at no cost. It should also be pointed out, if the contractor fails to get the necessary approval, he may not be paid. So far as design is concerned, we have two forms of design obligation. One is called due skill and care. The other is fitness for purpose. Due skill and care is the standard that will be applied to any architect, consultant, engineer, or other designer who does not carry out the actual construction of the works. So, for example, were I to instruct an architect tomorrow to do some design, and all I do is say, carry out the design as per your quote, and I don't state what standard it will be, it will be due skill and care. The reason for this is architects, designers and the like are considered to be professionals, the same as doctors. If you have, unfortunately, an operation with a doctor, you cannot say that that operation must be fit for its purpose. In other words, everybody, every operation must be a success. So no one will be allowed to die. What a doctor must do is they must do the best. They must do what any other doctor would be expected to do. In other words, due skill and care. So such a term will be implied into a contract where an architect or other designer has undertaken the works. However, the courts think that contractors are more, far more able, in effect, than such designers because they are not only undertaking the design, they are also constructing the works. And therefore, a far greater obligation will be imposed upon them unless the contract says otherwise. And that standard will be fitness for purpose. Fitness for purpose means that it doesn't matter why something has failed, you're responsible for it. It must meet the purpose for which it was intended. So let's just give an example. It wasn't that long ago that asbestos was commonly used for fire protection. It was used by everybody and specified by everybody. And therefore, anyone who used it or specified it was doing exactly the same as what other people were doing. They were therefore meeting due skill and care because there was not perceived to be a problem. However, as time has shown, asbestos is anything but fit for the purpose because of its uh, potential of breaking down. The consequence is, is it is not fit for purpose. So we can therefore identify the quite considerably greater owner onus placed upon a party who has 
fitness for purpose imposed upon them. To overcome that, the contract provides for the contractor to be responsible to a standard of due skill and care. So just to confirm, under the design and build JCT form, the contract provides for the contractor to be responsible to a standard of due skill and care, the lesser obligation. I'm just going to go to the standard form without contractor's design. That contract, unless it's got the provisions for uh, contractor's design portions, doesn't include for any design. The contractor is meant to carry out the works in accordance with the employer's design. So there is no term in the contract. It follows that if the contractor actually takes on design where they ought not to, because there is no provision in the contract as to what is the standard, the contractor will take on fitness for purpose. Now, as many of you, of you will know, my background is in construction. I've worked on many construction projects. And what I found all too often to be the case on contracts where there was no design imposed upon the contractor was that you would get a set of drawings, you would look at them and they wouldn't work. So you would issue a request for information. You may or may not get them back. Having got them back, you would look at it and work out again. This still doesn't work. I haven't got details. I haven't got what I need to construct the works. You've got an old site agent who's worked on the, on, in construction in many years and says, well, I know what needs to be done. We'll do this. By so doing, which is, let's be honest, very, very commonplace, the contractor will take on fitness for purpose, even though he has no obligation for design under the standards form that he's been employed under and is not to be paid. So do be careful. As I mentioned before, the contractor is not responsible for the employer's requirements. And that is provided at clause 2.11. However, clause 2.11 is quite often deleted. So do be careful. Do look to see whether clause 2.11 has been deleted and or amended. It is not an uncommon amendment. And the main task is placing the responsibility upon the contractor for all the design in the employer's requirements. Case is Henry Boot. Um, prior to 2.11 being in the contract, there was no such clause. And what was believed to be the case was that the contractor was only responsible for the design that it undertook, but that not any design within the employer's requirements. What then happened in this case was there were problems with certain beams, ring beams, and those ring beams were not adequately designed and such design was included in the employer's requirements. The consequence was that it went to court and it was determined that it was Henry Boot's failure. They were the design and build contractor and under the form at that time, it was deemed that they were required to review those drawings and to identify if there were any deficiencies in them and which they'd failed to be done. As a consequence, 2.11 was, in, was introduced to make it clear that the contractor is not responsible for the design in the ERs and that such design will be treated as a change and hence to be valued as a variation and also may be both a relevant event and a relevant matter. Clause, uh, this case of Hogard also deals with that issue of fitness for purpose uh, being imposed upon a contractor. So far as the design is concerned, the design produced by the contractor is only able to be used by the, by the employer 
under license in regards to the works as have been constructed and not for any other use. The contractor, and if it is the case, the architect he has employed, retains ownership of those drawings and all that is being given is a license for them to be used in relation to the works as constructed and not beyond. Now what we've identified is that we have a set of employers requirements and the set of contractors proposals. And the first question that often arises is which one takes priority? Now the point is, is they're both in the contract. There is no priority of documents clause that says that the ERs or the CPs take priority. All the contract actually says is that the contractor is of the view that the CPs meet the employer's requirements, but nothing further. Now the reason for this is that the, the contract is produced by the Joint Contract Tribunal who represents employers, architects, structural engineers, contractors, and so forth. And they didn't feel it was right that the CPs or the ER should take priority over the other. And as a consequence, they both have equal standing. However, it will come as no surprise that one of the standard amendments to the form is to make the ERs have priority over the contractor's proposals. So those of you who are contractors, look out for that amendment. Those of you who are employers, a stand amendment to make, which obviously increases the risk placed upon the contractor. In my experience, probably 80% of contracts have been so amended to make the ERs have priority over the CPs. Now, unfortunately, it's not uncommon that there are conflicts and inadequacies in the ERs. And the question is, is how are they dealt with? So what should happen is if the contractor identifies any such conflicts or inadequacies, he should, in the first instance, notify the employer, the employer's agent. Now, where the CPs deals with that inadequacy, then that's all the contractor has to do. But where there are conflicts or inadequacies in the ERs, the CP, the contractor has to submit his proposal. So he can submit, let's just say, for example, there is design A, design B, and they're in conflict. The contractor can either propose design A, design B, or indeed put forward his own proposal, C. And then the employer's agent must come back with an instruction advising which of the proposals he's, he accept and such instruction shall constitute a change. In other words, it will be a change, a variation and potentially a, a relevant event, relevant matter if there is delay. But again, unsurprisingly, this is one of the standard amendments. Quite often, it is provided that the contractor shall advise of any inadequacies in conflict and shall put forward a proposal, but that it will not constitute a change. So again, be very careful and look to see if that clause has been amended. I should add, it is vitally important that where there are two conflicts, that the contractor notifies the employer's agent of such conflict and seeks his instruction. If the contractor, rather than doing so, simply progresses with the one he thinks he prefers, it could be the case that at a later date, the employer comes back and says, I don't want that one, I want the other one. And the contractor will be responsible and require to change it. We then have conflicts and inadequacies in the contractor's proposals. The procedure is exactly the same. The contractor, when identifying such conflicts or inadequacies, is to notify the employer's agent. The employer's agent then has to instruct which of the relevant proposals he wants. But in regards to the contractor's proposals, such instruction shall not constitute a change. 
In other words, unlike in relation to the ERs, it is the contractor's responsibility. You can therefore see, as I mentioned before, the danger of saying the ERs shall form the CPs. Because by so doing, in that the ERs are now the CPs, any inadequacy will be the contractor's responsibility and they will not be able to seek a change for such instruction. As I mentioned before, if there are conflicts between the ERs and the CP, CPs deal with conflicts within the ERs, the CPs basically are what the contractor complies with. But where there are conflicts between the two, the contractor should notify the employer and seek instruction, but it is somewhat uncertain as to exactly what is the situation in such circumstances, because as I've mentioned, there is no priority between the two documents. And the contract is anticipating that the CPs comply with the ERs. What we then have is the requirements for the contractor to carry out the works in accordance with the statutory obligations. Now that is a fundamental obligation. That is the contractor's responsibility to carry out the works within the requirements of all statutory, including building regs. So it doesn't matter whether such works are detailed within the ERs or not, the contractor nevertheless has the obligation to comply with it. I was involved in a project some years ago where the contract in the ERs and the CPs didn't deal with sound transference. And as a consequence, the design as developed didn't meet statutory requirements and the contractor was nevertheless responsible for doing a lot more work. In that it dealt with or was complying with statutory requirements, it wasn't deemed a change and as such, the contractor was entitled to no further money. As I say, the contractor should be dealing with that design development and should be seeking the agreement thereto of it from the employer's agent. The next thing is we have is changes post the base date. We have in the contract, in the contractor's particulars, a base date. The base date should be 14 days from the date, uh, 14 days prior to the date of tender. The reason for that is, is that it is perceived the contractor has priced for all of the things he was aware of up to 14 days before he submitted his tender. And therefore anything after that date he hasn't priced and should be a change. What we then have is, is what nature of changes could apply? Well, for example, where there has been some form of planning permission put in place, but subsequently the planning department wants something more onerous, then the contracts can claim as a change. Equally, where there has been a change in building regulations and that occurs post the base date, it is again a change entitling the contractor to additional payment. A prime example of that nature of problem will be the implications of Grenfell. I have no doubt that there are substantial changes in what is now acceptable with cladding, which were not in place prior to Grenfell. As a consequence, were a contractor have priced pre-Grenfell and that the design obligations or building requirements have become more difficult post Grimfall and hence post the base date, this will be a change entitling the contractor to a change and additional monies. As you can imagine, it is again not uncommon for the contract to be amended and to include that any changes post the base date are not a change. As I can said, 
the J JCT design and build form is one of the most heavily amended contracts I see. Nearly always, the employer has amended it to increase the design obligations placed upon the contractor in seeking to make the employer's requirements have priority over the contractor's proposals, in seeking to impose upon the contractor the full design, including any design included in the ERs, for any conflict in the ERs, so they do not constitute a change, and also for any changes post the base date. So do be aware and do check. Now, what I refer to here is the inclusive price principle. People often ask, why do we have such thick contracts? Why are there so many pages within it? And indeed, if you go to the minor works form of contracts and compare it with the design and build form of contract, it will be no surprise that the design and build contract is much heavier. There are considerably more pages in it. And the reason for that is, is that the contract is setting down the risks and procedures applicable to the two parties. And those, part, those risks might be different if the contract was silent. I was involved in a project some time ago concerning piling in Norfolk. What basically had happened was the employer was looking to develop a site and had gone out and obtained a soil report and an outline design. That design, outline design and soil report was then provided to a piling con company and the piling company submitted a quotation based upon the design that had been provided within the soil report. And all they did was they provide for piling. X amount of piling um, and gave a set price. And that quotation was accepted. So all we had was an offer from piling company to carry out certain works and an acceptance. There were no other provisions. There was no domestic form of contract, JCT form or anything else. There was simply an offer and an acceptance. The piling company then went down to site in Norfolk, and if you don't know Norfolk, um, you, or if you do know Norfolk, you may be aware that it is common for the ground conditions to be chalk. And what you find with chalk is that there are lots of voids. So the contract, the piling company came down to site, and what they did was they started piling, um, and they piled and they started uh, with their concrete lorry coming down to site and they're pumping concrete into the piles and they're pumping concrete into the piles and they're pumping concrete into the piles and they completely continue and basically they are filling up the whole of the ground in Norfolk because the concrete is just dissipating and what they had to do was to use some form of encased piles whereby the concrete could not go into those voids. Now, as you can imagine, this was hugely more expensive, but they were not entitled to any additional amount of money because of what I've referred to here, the inclusive price principle. They have quoted for doing works and there is an implied term, unless the contract otherwise provides, that what they are proposing to do is possible and that they will do it. And it is irrelevant that it may be far more costly or expensive than they have priced for or anticipated. Now initially you may consider that seems rather onerous and unfair. But let me give you this example. We have a little old lady who is looking to have an extension built on the back of her house. And a builder comes out and says, oh, love, I can do that extension uh, and it'll be £10,000. And what I allow for is uh, simple strip foundations, etc., etc., etc." So the little old lady says, oh, yeah, that seems nice. Thank you very much. I accept. And then the contractor comes back, well, I'm sorry, love. I'm afraid, you know, whilst I've allowed for this, that's not what's possible. 
because building regs, this, that, and the other, requires me to do all these additional works. So whilst you've accepted £10,000 as a price, it's actually cost you £100,000, please pay me. Quite clearly, that would be, to say the very least, unfair. And that is why the inclusive price principle kicks in. What it says is, is if a contractor comes down and gives a quotation for doing an amount of works, he has warranted he can do that and complete it. And hence our builder would be responsible for doing all necessary work to complete that extension and at no additional cost. But that is what is the position at common law. Where the contract provides otherwise, then the situation is different. And quite clearly the contract, the JCT design and build contract is different. It sets down a whole lot of scenarios where the contractor is entitled to additional monies. You will see in the notes going through all these provisions and case law dealing with the inclusive price principle. So let's summarise where we are. We have the JCT design and build contract. The intention is, is that the employer produces the employer's requirements. Those requirements can be hugely detailed or very simplistic. It is at the employer's choice. What the contractor then does is to produce those contractors' proposals and which should meet the employer's requirements that further develop the design. To the extent that there is design in the employer's requirements, the employer is responsible for such design under clause 2.11. But be careful, that clause is quite often deleted and as a consequence, the contractor is responsible for the ERs. As I've mentioned, we have the ERs and the CPs under the standard form. There is no priority of documents. But again, a standard amendment is to make the ERs have priority over the CPs. Next thing is the contract provides that where there are Errors, where there are discrepancies within the ERs, it is for the contractor to identify those discrepancies and to put forward their proposal. The employer's agent then instructs which proposal they accept and that will constitute a change. But again, a standard amendment is to say it will not constitute a change. So far as the contractor's proposals, the same procedure applies contractor submits or a, a, submits a proposal for any discrepancy in his proposals, the employer notifies and instructs which one he accepts and it shall not constitute a change. We then have any further design as we've identified the contractor should be issuing all their drawings for approval as the works progress. If works are carried out Without approval, the contractor does it at his own risk. Such drawings, if the design submission procedure is adopted, is for the employer to come back within 14 days with A, B or C. A, to, A is approved, B is approved with comments, C is rejected. Where it's rejected, it has to be resubmitted. Where the comments are applied, the contractor can carry out the works in accordance with those comments without resubmitting. But if he does so, he is deemed to have accepted they, they do not constitute a change. Where the contractor doesn't agree with such comments, he should notify the employer within seven days. It is my experience all too often this design procedure is not properly followed. So do be careful. You need to ensure that you submit all necessary drawings to the employer's agent for their approval. Otherwise, there is a potential for the employer to say that what is constructed is wrong. We then have changes post the base date. This is particularly the case where we may have outbound planning or where we're dealing with listing buildings or otherwise. 
The way we deal with it is that any changes that happen post the base date, which is stated in the contractors in the contract particulars and is generally on or around the date of the tender, any changes that are post that date will constitute a change. Just to give you an example I was involved in, um, people were dealing with three large houses in um, central London and they were being converted into three flats. The problem was, was this building was listed and English heritage came down. And what they said was, oh no, you won't be doing that. And they imposed a whole node of required changes, all that were post the base date. And thereby the contractor was entitled to changes for such works. But as I say, again, it is not an unstandard amendment to say that such changes post the base date shall not constitute a change. Okay, I uh, hope that's been of assistance. Julie, are there any questions? Yes, there are, Richard. Um, right, the first question we've got is a fairly lengthy one. Clause 2.6.12 includes a relevant event for change in legislation. Um, the person's written this says that, that my contract terms have been amended to include reasonable foreseeability i.e. if a change in the legislation is reasonably foreseeable, then there is no recovery under this clause. We know there is a pending change to Fire Safety Order 2005 to remove combustible insulation. We're about to go into contract and our design still includes combustible insulation. Are we at risk of no recovery if the regulations subsequently change because of this fact we have reasonable foreseeability? Really simple answer, yes. <laughs> Okay. That's exactly what it's looking to do. It is saying that it's not simply has to be a change. It must be a change you cannot foresee. Mm -hmm. And whoever has asked that question can foresee it because indeed they've identified it. So right. yeah, they would not be able to recover for that. I suppose there could be an argument to say that whilst I anticipated a change, I didn't anticipate that. Yeah. But I think it's a difficult argument. I think you would be... Uh, would advise to um, price for what you can foresee and it is unlikely you'll be able to claim. Okay. And then someone else has asked, in your experience, have you dealt with disputes regarding employer amendments to the JCT being unfair contract terms? The amendments are very onerous in some cases. They can't. Okay. Uh, there is no such thing as an unfair contract term. What we have, and people, uh, will be aware we have the unfair contract terms act and what the unfair contract terms act is it says that certain terms you can't have so for example i cannot have a term that excludes my liability for death so if someone is injured and killed as a result of my failure i cannot exclude that term not have an exclusion clause in that term so there are certain terms you simply cannot have but they relate to, as I say, death and things of that nature. So as far as terms that are, let's say, are extremely onerous, what the Unfair Contract Terms Act says that, that those terms must be brought to the reasonable attention of the other party. So provided they are brought to the reasonable attention of the other party, despite them being so onerous, it doesn't present a problem. So... If you go to car parks, for example, you will always find that those terms are put right next to the paying machine. The reason for that is, is they are therefore being brought to the reasonable attention of the party. Now, there is a case called Bacall that concerns soil investigation reports. And what this report did was it gave details of what the soil conditions were, but said that the contractor could not rely upon them. As you can imagine, what was found out was those um, investigations weren't right and therefore the employer having issued this document sought to rely upon that term. The court said that they could not rely upon the term because it had not been brought to the reasonable attention of the contractor because it was at the back of the report and wasn't in sufficiently big enough writing. Okay. We've now been asked, could you, please could you explain clause 1.3, agreement to be read as whole? Sorry, say that again, Julie. 
<clears throat> Please could you explain clause 1.3, agreement to be read as whole? Um, I don't know, I, I unfortunately don't have a copy of the contract in front of me to be able to deal with that one. If the person um, would like to give me a call, um, I'll look it up and explain it to them over the phone. Okay. Right, <clears throat> if there's no more questions, it seems that we've, uh, we've gone through all of those. So thank you again, Richard, for that presentation and thank you to everyone for attending. Um, as we've previously said, if you have any specific queries, um, such as the 1.3, uh, please email Richard directly. Um, oh, we've just had one come in. Can a, contract can a contractor refuse to comply with the 12 month rectification process if there is a breach in payment terms? Um, very strangely, I have a, a, a matter dealing with that at the very moment. Um, and simply, the contract provides that where a payment has not been made by the final date for payment, the contractor can issue a seven day notice of intention to suspend. By so doing, and with the seven day having a lap, they can suspend all or any part of the works and which would include the making good of any defects, be them in the rectification period or within the list that is issued 14 days after the end of the rectification period. So in simple terms, yes, they can, subject to having issued a seven day notice of intention to suspend and where the, the employer has failed to pay amounts properly due by the final date for payment. Right. Okay, so we'll wrap that up there. Thank you very much again, Richard, um, for answering all those. Thank you for the presentation. Thanks to all for attending. Uh, any specific questions to Richard, it's Richard Silver at silverllp.com. And we hope to see you at another seminar online soon. Thank you, Richard. Thank you all.